This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Released on Sunday, July 17th, 2016. This Agile Life, episode 113. Weekly and stabler. The software industry transforms more and more every day. Agile methods are quickly replacing traditional ones. The question is, are you agile enough? This podcast is devoted to agile and lean software development. Time to welcome your agile coaches on this agile life. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of this agile life, John Sextro. Joining me this episode, we have Craig Buchak. Hello, everyone. How's it going, Craig? Pretty good. Just got back from a long weekend the other day and recovering from my vacation. Well, welcome back. Also joining us on the episode, we have Jason Tice. Hi, John. I'm so glad you got that refresher and you remembered how to start the podcast without having to refer to our very prescriptive guidance. That's right. And I remembered to hit record and we all hit record, so we're good to go. Are you sure? I am sure. I'm sure. Do you have a, I'm sure on my end. Do you have a test for that? I do. Is it part of our definition of for ready? I don't know. You're wearing me definition out. Definition of ready. I'm not used to the definition of ready. I guess oh. we've had them before. Definition well, of done is more commonly talked about. Uh, yes, but there's danger there because if we haven't well, def- if, if our work is not well defined before we begin, how do we know that we're actually going in the right direction to be to in the first place? Yeah, it makes sense. I don't think I've ever heard it called the definition of ready. Wow. Um, okay. But, That's it. Uh, but I like the idea. Interesting. You and I hang out in different circles, Craig, as we know, which is uh, which is interesting because yes. the the crew that I in the advisory world that I work in, we're always we're definition of done, definition of ready, and uh, again this summer we were, I was out spending a little bit of time in the David Anderson conference, you know, where he's all talking about anti fragility now and how to um, uh, a different take on different ways to think about why we focus on lean and agile. I'll make this easy for you, Jason, and I'll just buy you a dictionary. You'll have to, that way you can stop defining things. Uh, but that's where once upon a time I was once upon a time I wasn't I an architect John well that was my job in big enterprise yes uh, so, uh, well, big some enterprise of us are busy is... doing things oh. ooh well, making they, uh, things I, we underestimate the value of having common language so we can actually achieve consensus on what we need to do actually I started on an agile dictionary this weekend so I, I do understand you know, we go back to our last episode with, or actually it was two episodes ago with Dave West from Scrum.org. Uh, I would suggest that if anyone's looking for a, a pretty well understood and, you know, common vocabulary for agile processes, you got to give a little bit of appreciation to the Scrum guys because they've done that. So it's, and it's pretty good. I'll give them some props for it. So, well, I heard that, uh, I heard that this agile thing is over with now. We're all going back to waterfall. What? Yeah, it's what Kent Beck said. Oh, really? Okay. Well, so tell us more, John. What's up with that? I don't know. You, uh, well, you, you sent us a video link from a few months ago. Kent recorded a, a, a short video about eight minutes long declaring that uh, Waterfall is back. And he's working at Facebook now, so I don't know if that's a, a sign. Maybe Facebook is kind of Waterfall-ish. I don't know. What do you, What did you get... Well, you you should you should stop listening to the podcast now if you if you're uh, if you haven't seen this video and go out and see the video. Uh, it's it's only seven and a half or eight minutes long. We've got the link in the show notes. It's on YouTube. Very easy to watch. And Jason, you want to give us a recap of what Kent says in that video? Well, and first and foremost, before we go there, I want to correct the record, John, because this actually came to us via our Slack channel or our Slack site from a listener. Uh, st- what is it? Stephen Christensen. And I apologize if I've ruined your name, but he, um, he threw the video on our um, episode idea Slack channel a couple days ago. And I just saw it and said, well, I haven't seen this one and watched it. And it, what Kent's talking about is it's interesting because he, takes the different components of a project um, or of a, of a, of a, 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 deli- a software delivery uh, activity. And he talks about there's the need to have a vision, which we talk about. And then there's the need to say that that vision is linked to a really a strategy, you know, a business strategy, business plan. Then 
we take that and we add the elements of a product to it. After we get to a product, we talk about architecture and engineering. And what those are phases that, you know, if you go back to the days, he says that, you know, back in the day, waterfall was okay. Let's approve the vision. And like effectively even have like a toll gate meeting where we approve the vision. Okay, now let's plan the strategy. Okay, we approve the strategy. Now let's go work on the product design. Okay, let's work on the product design and make sure it supports the architect, the um, the business plan. Okay, we've got a product design. Now let's go architect and code the product and you know approve, approve, approve toll gates, whatever you want to call them. It was a waterfall. What he says is what he's observed is that in agile. To be effective, we need to learn what we're doing. So we do all of those things at the same time. A little bit of vision, a little bit of strategy, a little bit of product, and then a little bit of architecture and implementation. And what happens is his what his his the thesis of the video is that the first thing that just kind of starts to stabilize after a period of time is the vision. And you get consensus from all stakeholders that, yeah, this is the vision we want to pursue. And then once that settles... A little bit later, you get to this point where, you know what? Um, okay, guess what? The strategy's sound. We've got a solid business plan, and, and, and we've done that. And so, okay, that's good. And then the next thing, a little bit later after that, you get so, you get a solid product design, you know, because, you know, you've, you've been working on it now for a long time because you've been doing all this stuff, but it kind of solidifies it. It's, he uses the term um, squishy and less squishy. Or actually, it's wiggly. Wiggly, or, wiggly, wiggly and, and stabler. Yeah, stabler. Yeah, real, real interesting, precise terms, but but you get it. So it, it's stabilizing, and then, and then last but not least, we get to the actual architecture and the code. And if you put that on a timeline, and he does this in the video, they they literally do they do line up where you know they they kind of become stabler sequentially. And so the what he talks about and what I got from this is there's a perception that oh, if I reflect on this whole project, yeah, okay, the first thing that got stable is the vision and then a little bit after that the next thing that stabilized was the strategy or the business plan and then the next thing that stabilized was the product design and okay that doesn't mean we should do a waterfall because what people are missing in that is the fact that what made those things stabilize was all the learning that occurred by doing work you know okay i got a vision idea i got an idea to support the vision let's go do a spike and test it let's go code it out to test that it's achievable that's what achieved the stability and I think what he was talking about, and I've seen this again in the business that I work in, where people are reverting back to say, let's go back to a toll gate or a, a toll gate process that that is a waterfall because we don't realize that we need to do the technical work to learn and get feedback that will better inform the vision, strategy and product design. So what do you guys think? I mean, that's that's the, that's my cliff notes of the video that, frankly, is almost as long as the video. So I obviously didn't do too well on that one. So, Craig, Craig, tell me where I'm wrong. No, that's that's mostly what I got. Um, but one of his points was that we have a cognitive bias that uh, the most recent things about an event are the ones we remember most. Um, and there's there's research that says if you are in pain um, at the beginning of a surgery as opposed to the end of the surgery, um, if you're in pain at the beginning of the surgery, but not at the end, then you'll remember that the surgery was pain free. But if you have pain at the end, you'll remember the surgery was painful. Um, so it's the same thing. Like if you'll remember the more stable end of each of those phases. And so you'll think, oh, well, that was pretty stable. I don't know why we needed to go through this unstable part, or I don't even remember the sta unstable part very much. So we'll just go through these stable phases in order, like they were where the order they stabilized and and that's basically back to waterfall it is and and i think if if indeed these things actually stabilize to the level which he purports that they do that you could do waterfall if they truly stabilized i mean the whole reason for using an agile approach is to be able to easily adapt to the changes that occur right i agree that maybe the vision being this kind of overarching thing, we're going to do, you know, this very big 10,000 foot uh, mission statement sort of vision that you can get sort of stabilized around that. Like we're going to produce a product that's going to uh, revolutionize the industry of toilet flushing, let's say, you know, so <laughs> that's our vision. But then the product w within that vision and the strategy to deliver that product I don't think those things truly stabilize uh, until 
you're kind of in a maintenance mode on the product. Well, but you, okay, let's say that you're going to make the, the better toilet, but then you find out, you know, your customer doesn't want a better toilet. They want, uh, yes. they want a shower. Exactly. You know, so, so you still have to do that work to find out what the customer wants. Um, and if you followed waterfall, you would have the perfect toilet and you would have spent a year on the perfect toilet when you could have spent, you know, a month on a, uh, not perfect toilet and then found out they wanted to shower. You and I are saying, I think the same things, Craig, because you're not actually, uh, the product is not actually ever stabilizing until you've, you put something out on the market and iterated through it and maybe done, you know, alpha beta tests and, and, um, I don't know, uh, trials, et cetera, with, with real users of your, of your new toilet, you know, and then you, then you discover, it's not a toilet. It's a shower that they want. I mean, come on. Nothing Nothing is stable. Well, but also at its core, you know, the other thing that was interesting because he talks all about it, but he doesn't define – he doesn't uh, – Ken doesn't talk about his definition of stability in the video because I would say that sta- – Bullshit. Well, but defining <laughs> – but I, I don't need a, I don't I don't need I don't need him to define stable. I know what stable is. All this stuff about coming up with definitions of ready and done and shit. Quit that. I know what the friggin' definitions well, of these things are. But what are. I'm going to say, John, from a business perspective, if you're a business owner, it's really your discretion to decide if something's stable or not. It's like, hi, I have a business. Like, I make the best toilet. I, I make the best. Um, you guys are using the toilet metaphor, so I make the best toilet flusher out there. Market data might say that, ooh, the market is pivoting away from toilet flushers and to something else, to showers like Craig's talking about. I'm the business owner. I'm a, I'm a stakeholder. I get to decide if I want to hold firm or if I want to evolve my business. So there is this idea that market factors should inform stability, but ultimately the business stakeholders get to decide, you know, kind of when something is stable and when it is not. Does that make sense? Oh, that's fine. I I agree that they get to de- decide when something has stabilized. But what I'm saying is it doesn't stabilize in the waterfall drawing that he makes. It doesn't stabilize like that. It might become more solidified and then we learn and it destabilizes, restabilizes, liquefies, restabilizes and and constantly does that over time. There if it what I'm saying Jason and and Craig is that if these things actually stabilized in some sort of a predictable fashion like that, that we could do waterfall. But especially from the the product, the design, and the engineering perspectives, those things do not stabilize like that. Design does not stabilize before engineering. No. They, they, they revolve around each other like a, a twin sun solar star thing. <laughs> you like that one, Craig? I do like that analogy. Um, but no, I think, I, I I don't think that we can have a product vision stabilize, you know, earlier than, so I don't think we can do them just in order without doing the, the following things. I don't think we can come up with a product vision without doing some engineering. And that's what Waterfall is to me. I, I don't think it quite works as well in waterfall as it is, as you're getting at. It was funny, Craig. What I love about this is I have a different take on what you just said, because I would say you can't have a product vision um, unless you've done some element of a viable business test that the product vision provides value to your intended market. And I can do that without a whole lot of engineering. Cause I could do it quick and dirty. You know, I could even do a paper prototype of my app and go and show it to people to do a, you know, that could constitute a business test. And there are, there are various ways to test a, a product design and or a business vision without doing any engineering whatsoever. Well, that's not how he, well, so well, the way his drawing works out, the way he shows the drawing is that while vision is happening, there's also strategy happening. There's also, design happening, product strategy happening, and then engineering. He shows that all those things are kind of happening. And I know that the drawing's not perfect or the video's not perfect or whatever, but if it was truly a waterfall, there would be a section where it was just visioning, right? That that stabilizes and then strategy starts theoretically and then product 
uh, design starts, etc. And those things wouldn't be running at all in concurrency with each other, which, which to me speaks to the fact that there's iteration going on, there's adaptability going on in there, and it's not really a waterfall. And I'm not saying he's saying it's really a waterfall. I think what he's trying, I think what he's trying to point out is that some of these things just have to happen before other things and that there's a sequencing. Yeah, there is. And, and I think, again, the whole genesis of the video is people have short-circuited that, that sequence to say, oh, just go back to a tollgate-based waterfall process, which is not the intent. But the question I want to ask you guys is because, John, you, you touched on it. If you watch the If you watch the video, he kind of does allude to the fact that, you know, when you start— you could potentially have where like all this stuff is going on and you've got the engineers trying to build an architecture to run some code, yet we don't even know the business problem the code's trying to solve yet. So is there any phasing that could occur in that model, in your opinion? I think it's like the, you know, th- th- that there should be some sort of phasing that happens. I don't think you would want to have a whole crew of developers kind of just going in all directions on something before you had sort of an idea, right? So get an idea, get sort of a, a vision, do a little pre-work, decide if you really want to invest in the product. It would it would probably be fiscally irresponsible for a company to like staff every position immediately and and proceed down some path without having done done some sort of like due diligence, right? What like lean startup sort of approach to things where you're like, let's let's start with some paper prototypes iterate around on something and decide if we're really going to build it. Yeah, I agree that you shouldn't um, start with a big team, start with a small team and, and grow it as, as you get more work to do, as you um, are going to iterate faster. Um, and as you prove it out, because otherwise you're throwing good money at the problem and it might not stick to the wall. Um, but I think that, we don't want to fall in the trap of looking back on a project and saying, Oh, that looks sort of like waterfall because we did all this upfront design first, uh, upfront planning. And that that's what he's trying to get at. I think is not to fall in the trap of looking in hindsight and thinking that it was one thing when we were actually, actually we're doing agile, uh, but it can, it can look like waterfall from hindsight. Well, that's interesting because I kind of got the sense that what he was saying was, in hindsight, it we were doing something more waterfallish. Even the you know maybe the the eye is fooled, or as you said, Craig, there maybe is this cognitive bias that uh, things happened a certain way. You you maybe see things in retrospect through rose colored glasses rather than as they were really occurring. I don't know. Maybe he's trying to say that that waterfall and agile aren't that different. I I don't know. Maybe he's trying to give us that impression too i'm gonna say that puts me one of the things that i kind of hoped he would say in the video that he didn't is really just called attention to the fact that you know at the end of the day the process between waterfall and agile is the same the cycle the end-to-end cycle time or you know the uh, the cadence of the change cycle is what's different because in agile world it's like no we need a vision but instead of brainstorming on a product vision for 18 months, I would say you should brainstorm on a product vision maybe for a few weeks, just enough to get consensus from the stakeholders that you know what you're doing, then move on to the next thing. So, but don't do that for 18 months, which is what you would have done back in the waterfall days. And then don't flush out your entire business plan, flush out enough of a business plan that you could generate revenue for your business and break even and then keep it small because then whatever is in that business plan in terms of the activities of the business those probably are going to become the features of your minimal viable product that then you should go build and i would think regular a business plan like that if you use a model like the business model canvas you could probably do that in a couple hours so go do it you know and, yeah I, th- I think you're saying but, the same thing i was getting at too yeah, it, it, so what I'm saying is fundamentally, if you look at the activities, and this is what I liked about the, about the video, because he said, you know, fundamentally, you know, Waterfall Agile, I mean, there are people, and again, we got Agile 2016 coming up in just a few weeks. I mean, there are people that will be talking, oh my goodness, Waterfall versus Agile, it's like this big war. And my message is, you know what, it's the same activities. In Agile, we just learn to do them faster. We do them, you know, very lightweight. We don't, we don't ignore them. 
You know, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've been in the Agile project where we didn't have a vision and it was horrible, like just like he said. So we so we don't ignore them. And that that's, I think, where, again, there are some people in the Agile community that take Agile and they use it as an excuse to not operate a rigorous, disciplined business. Oh, we don't need a vision. We don't need a business plan. We don't need forecasts. We don't need to tell our stakeholders when we're going to have dates that we're actually going to have something done. No, you need to do all that because at the end of the day, you're running a business. So and that's where... I liked it because that's what he says. But my say is, guess what? You do the same things, just learn how to do them faster. That's a great point about doing them faster. And I think one of I think one of the key differentiators here, Jason, was something that you were you you threw into your your kind of word soup when you were talking about the whole ad, agile <laughs> I'm process. Sorry, originally. I'm a little crazy about this topic. <laughs> yeah, the rant when you were saying you said toll gates and and checkpoints, right? Which to me just reeks of waterfall because what you're what you're saying when you cross over a, a one of these checkpoints or phase gates or whatever is that there's no going back right you've said we've we're done with the vision it's we check the box we we count up all the dots on the on the project plan and we move on the gantt chart bar is filled in or whatever you know and we're never going back to that but if you iterate if you use a true iterative approach, there's always a chance to to revisit and to adapt, to inspect and adapt on vision, to inspect and adapt on strategy across well, everything. Way, you, brought is, to, you brought up Togay's chat. So, I, mean, I didn't bring you, him up. Well, you brought, brought him up. up. You brought him up again. So I re-brought I mean, him up. Okay, so John, what is the fundamental problem with Togay's? Well, I mean, let's be... You let's can't go be, back. No, no, that's not that's not the problem. That, that's a perception. They're arbitrary. No. I'm going to be very open. I'm going to say they're non-value add. Of course there's a, they're there, non-value add. There's a perception they add value, and there's a perception that if respected, they can they can provide some level of control. And and honestly, again, this is where if you're listening to us, I would encourage you again. Governance is governance is there for a reason. But there are some in the Azure community, and this is where I wish, I wish Amos were here tonight, because this is where Amos and I have talked governance before. We've worked on projects together, and and maybe Amos and I worked in an environment once where there was a governance system that was too rigid. Because here's the deal. We had toll gates. We had a change control board that you had to go and ask for permission from. And once upon a time, that change control board rendered a decision that we don't want to use this piece of technology because we've deemed it's a security risk for our business. And a decision was rendered, we'll not do it. Other people had started to invest and do stuff in that technology. And I will share that within 48 hours, the entire decision was reversed. Just during this, there's no value because at the end of the day, people are going to do what they want to do. And so my statement is we should guide alignment to that rather than say, you know, yes or no. Does it make sense? Yeah. I, so <laughs> if there's security issues. And maybe I've gone into the. Yeah. If there's security issues, that doesn't seem to be. Uh, well, first of all, I don't know how change control board was defining products to use, but that that seems odd. Um, and and a change control board it's and an agile managed, thing it seems agile project seems really it's weird. It's called too. a managed environment. Well, that's fine too. Where for us, to, but those well, are your, no, but it's a licensed those are your product, constraints. So. I mean, your constraints are your constraints. That whether it's agile or waterfall. Yeah, but what, so what I'm saying is the cha- the change control board is there for a reason. The security guy came and gave a security assessment of the product. Basically, the the change control board appreciated his input and made a decision based upon his input. And then because some sunk costs had already been made to build capability on top of that product. Oh, let's just now discount all the stuff the security guy said and say it's okay to use it. Okay, so that's a that's a that's an intriguing story and I like that story. But what I want to ask Jason is you said Toll gates, phase gates are, uh, they don't have, they're not value add, right? So why are they there? Well, that's what I'm saying. They, they give a false perception of control because the example that I'm sharing here with this, this, this security thing that was denied, but then reapproved. I mean, we incurred the cost to do an assessment, evaluate the tool, go through a, a collaborative governance process that was facilitated via change control board for better, for worse. The board rendered a decision. And then within 48 hours, 
you know, which was a control mechanism. And then within 48 hours, everyone said, oh, my goodness, we 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 reversed that decision because of some other stuff. And which basically proves that people were already using the technology to do stuff before it was approved, therefore not respecting the governance process. Does it make sense? I'm not sure how that answers the question, but uh, to, to answer John's question, I think maybe that they're there, <laughs> that they're there to provide the illusion of completeness of a, a, to a certain point. I think you can say, Oh, we've gotten through this gate. So we're 35% done. And so that illusion is, valuable well that's just fa- that's failure to measure true business value yes. is what that is you know this idea that oh i could have a product that's i could have a feature that's 30 percent right. done well if it's not 100 percent done it probably doesn't provide value so you know that's just a measurement failure so it's a control point and i think it's supposed to be a control point that gives leadership the ability to um course correct right so as as you approach as you in theory, <laughs> Craig, right? In theory. Shouldn't we be course correcting at all times? I think so. But but yeah. management doesn't want to course correct every day, right? They want to give you the ability or give somebody the ability to do some work, come back, tell us what progress they've made. And now 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 leadership wants a chance to course correct to say, yes, you're approved. You get to pass through this or no, you're not approved. You need to go back and do more due diligence in this particular phase of, of whatever. Seems like agile demos at every iteration would probably be a better uh, yeah. way to do well, that. But let me ask you guys a question because well, cause here's one thing that popped into my mind as I watched this video was the idea of his idea of what, what was it? It was wiggliness and what was it? Stabler. So if you're working on, on a project off a spend plan, there becomes a point in time where Hi, I've made some significant investments. So I've been building on this platform and I've got, let's say, 10 of the 13 features in my MVP already implemented. All of a sudden, some brand new platform comes out and oh my goodness, I could use that for my product. But you know what? I could become part of my architecture. But you know what? I can't afford with the investment I have remaining to refactor the product onto the new platform and complete the MVP. So I need to stake the course, finish the MVP on the the architecture I committed to, and then you know what, after I release, I can decide. I, I, when I listened to him, I said, you know what, that's safe because I've watched teams and projects that try to pivot to something when they don't have enough investment left to possibly finish what they started and they ultimately let the business or they let their customers down. Yeah, it's always hard. Craig, I think he's slowly but surely degrading back to big enterprise. Ah, oh. uh, oh, what? Did, that's that's your business, isn't it? No, big big enterprise was the was his persona. I, I, Remember, I, I, was, Mr. Oh, big Mr. enterprise. Big enterprise. Rah. 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 <laughs> so, no. Plus, <laughs> yeah. I'm, so, so you were talking about you were talking about Wiggly there, and 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 I thought that was interesting because. He showed that it takes you know time to stabilize in each of these phases, um, you know the the vision, the strategy, the the product design, and the engineering, and and, and they sort of stabilize in that area in in that order. Um, but what what I found interesting was that you know the engineering is going to be unstable and wiggly for longer than than the strategy and the vision. And one of the things that I like about Agile is it embraces reality. And so he's pointing out this reality that we we really haven't noticed very much before. And he's saying, hey, this is how we take advantage of it. We iterate on the vision, and then we iterate on the strategy, then the product design, and then, then the engineering. And when when we do it that way, you know, we get stability in the vision while still iterating. And then we're able to um, sort of narrow down on, on the product design and the engineering as, as we go. And so... Facing that reality and understanding that reality, we can we can work better and and not be so fearful that the engineering is just going to bounce all over the place and and we're not going to have a, a, a you know a guidance on on where which direction to go. But see, I question though, and you know, again, it'd be, it'd be just interesting to talk about um about the video with with Kent because the question I throw out there is 
I thought it interesting that he said the engineering could be unstable for so long because if we're using good software, good, you know, effective principles of software craftsmanship where we're using patterns, we're using object oriented design, why would we not see a, as soon as we start building, why would we not see stability and patterns emerge? I think you do. I think there's stability in the patterns and the architecture. Yeah, but if your if your architecture is still changing, then your your code down at the day to day level is is going to change, in, in step with that. So it's gonna you know it's gonna follow on to that. If you're changing your strategy or if you're changing what you're going to build, then yeah, your de- your engineering is definitely going to change. Um, and I also find that as teams get better, they get better at coding. Um, you know, I've talked about how. And Amos and I have talked about how, you know, when your team starts out, they're going to have big stories and they're going to vary in size and your estimations are going to vary um, for reality a lot more. But as you as you get going, your stories tend to be broken up. They tend to be more regularly sized and they tend to be smaller. I think that's part of the stabilization process. My my only comment to that is they those those trends tend to occur more when the team of people who is doing the work agrees to work together as a team. Well, that seems like a good thing to happen. Well, I would agree, but trust me. If, if you don't have that, then uh, you might want to look at some uh, Well, solutions. but at the same time, I'm sure that there might be, and again, there are lots of people listening to this podcast, and uh, there are many people that are on teams that are teams, but the team may not for various reasons, be aligned to want to work together. And so I want people to understand that what you're saying, Craig, are outcomes when you have an effective team that is aligned to solve a problem and work together to do so. Well, I think that's what we're all trying to work towards. Yes. So anyway, so that's a that's a little man in the mirror assessment for our listeners. Here's the last last thing that I see in this saw in this video was that it seemed like this was the the true sense of waterfall where the shit rolls down the hill, right? Vision, strategy, all that stuff comes from above. It's passed down and I don't see any feedback loops. And what I've seen successful with agile teams is that a lot of the stuff that really contributes to vision contributes to product strategy contributes to overall, um, user design and those sort of things come from trenches where people are, are are have their hands in the code they see where things can how things can work well and they may be even you know consumers or users of of what it is that they're building and therefore they have insights and feedback and and can inform product strategy can inform overall strategy can inform vision and unless you're you know working sort of in that lean approach where everyone is part of or some portion of, of everyone is part of all of those sessions, I don't see that the organization and the company is giving enough credence and giving enough um, opportunity for feedback throughout the entire team. Craig, what do you think? Yeah, I've run into a lot of situations, even in pretty good agile teams, where um, by the time it gets to the developer, it's already designed on how it's supposed to work, how everything's laid out, and you've just lost a lot of um, potential brainstorming and and problem solving that your developers could have helped with um, to come up with a better solution. That's that rolls downhill here. We've already designed it all for you here. Just engineer it. Yeah. Here code monkeys type this into your IDE and smoke it. Yeah. But that's where, again, I'm going to throw it out there that as, as the agile community has grown exponentially within the last few years, Something that, again, Agile Alliance has looked at it. Scrum Alliance has looked at it. You know, the, the, the community has grown exponentially. The practice that is not being respected is keeping the different segments of the value stream or levels of the organization properly aligned to fidelity boundaries. So this idea that, whoa, hi, whoa, whoa. I'm an ex- Slow down there. Fidelity boundaries. You're going to have to define that one. So what I'm saying there, hi, I'm an executive, okay? So I could say that, yeah, we need to build a system that allows me, like, we need to build a system that allows our store to be able to support 
um, you know, in-store e-commerce on a mobile app. Great. Okay. Thank you, executive. Hey, Mr. Executive, could, how much money do you have to spend on that? Okay, a couple million. Awesome. Hey, IT takes that. Okay, guys, the, the leadership team has asked us to build a mobile application to provide an awesome in-store purchasing experience on their mobile device. Let's brainstorm. So what I see constantly in the business that I work in and the, the innovation practice I lead is where people from the business are in, allowed to go way, way, way beyond the boundary of the business into development and and dictate what happens, which is which is um it challenges the autonomy of a, of a development team and the reason why they do that is because a lot of times like you said john there's poor feedback or there's limited awareness as to what's going on and how the activities of the development team support the business vision did that make sense i think you and craig are in violent uh violent agreement so i just think so i so I just, I mean, that's my statement. And I think the, as a community, we just need to take a step back and say that as we're growing and you're having agile teams that work as part of large organizations, there is a boundary where, you know, it's like, hey, the the business or leadership needs to provide autonomy to dev teams to do cool things. And like John said, be open and receptive to feedback. And and I think that, again, in that waterfall mode or waterfall mode that, that Kent pointed out in the video, uh, that's just the feedback is missing. So well, here, so here's here's my final word on this, and I'll give you guys a chance to have a final word as well. I think putting a video like this out on YouTube that says the return of waterfall and it's back and all this with your name Kent Beck behind it is it, it is dangerous and is uh, harmful to all of the work that people have done in in the in the name of quality software engineering following agile practices because because of the same reason that we spoke with Dave West about scrum is that people look at stuff very superficially right and they won't even watch the 8 minute video they'll just say eh, Kent Beck says waterfalls back agile's dead and it'll be it'll be um you know all of a sudden they'll be consulting practices jason jump popping up all over the place of it's time to it's time to transform your organization back to waterfall <laughs> i'll sell you i'll sell you a waterfall transfer. Yes. i love it waterfall yeah, transformation let's back, start a back company. approved no, let's certification not. let's not Bink. let's not put a big stamp uh. kent back stamp on it waterfall transformation oh, oh, oh. Let, hey john how we scale waterfall how about that one there you go the scaled the scaled waterfall framework scaled SWF. waterfall SWF. That's not cool. That doesn't. That doesn't spell Sorry. anything. Swift. You got to work on that one, Jason. Uh, uh, so that spells a few things. Um, so what? Are, wow, what are your anyway. final words on this, Jason? So a couple. Things. Number one, I'd love some feedback because real life. I, I the reason I love this video, and again, I think I thank our listeners for sharing a topic we could talk about. I hope they found this helpful or insightful. Was I? Uh, I live and work in this space that was talked about in this video, and really try to help people understand that uh, you need a vision, you need a strategy, you need to invest a little bit in it, and then you need to go learn from doing real work what's good and what's bad. And, and just like you said, iterate. So I, I saw the video, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is my life. And I said, it's awesome. The other thing that I thought was awesome about this, so again, if you haven't stopped, like John said, to watch this video, go do it, is he did it as what I call a post-it presentation, So it's very, which is something that I do, and I'm out at, conferences and stuff doing these where you just have a bunch of post-it notes and you move them around and you talk about them and you don't use PowerPoint and it's it's kind of fun it's uh it's a little it's it's a it's crafty I'll use the term so so check it out and again love some feedback if you guys heard some stuff tonight that was like what the heck did did we say ask us about it and we can clarify all right and Craig you get the the final 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 word huh. uh, I agree with John that the the video is you know, the title's a bit misleading and it's not really clear what he's trying to get at. Like is, should we be going back to waterfall? He didn't really talk about iteration. So it's not really clear what, what he's getting back here. And I think it can be misinterpreted by people. This week's hottest picks. All right, Craig, you're up first with your picks this week, this episode. All right. My first pick is Summerfest. Uh, this is a music festival in Milwaukee. I went this weekend. We saw two concerts. It was awesome. They have 13 stages. It runs 10 days over two weeks. Um, lots of music, and it's in the middle of the summer when Milwaukee is 
warm but not hot like the rest of the Midwest. So uh, it's very cool. Uh, my second pick is uh, I talked about. Well, that doesn't was, that pick doesn't do anybody any good now. It's over. Well, there'll be one next year. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Uh, I talked about uh, working on a glossary of Agile terms. Uh, Agile Alliance actually has one that's pretty good. It's not as complete as the one I'm working on. Uh, and I've got a link to that in the show notes. All right. We'll go let Jason go next. I think he's broken the pick machine again. He's got a lot of picks here. I got a ton of live event picks, so I'm just going to run these down. So if you listen to us in, uh, if you listen to this in late July, 2016, Got some stuff going on at Agile 2016 in Atlanta. So I got two sessions. Uh, interesting. Um, I'm actually doing a collaboration with a real life customer. So um, it's called Let's Be Awesome. It's Tuesday, July 20, July 26th at 10:45 a.m., where we're going to have a very open conversation about how what it's like to be a vendor and a a a recipient of Agile development services. So with a real life customer. So if you've ever wondered what it. If, for the people that have uh, who've actually given us feedback on this podcast that says, is my persona a made for podcasting entertainment figure? You can ask questions about that because you'll hear real life feedback that no, it's not. So uh, that's let's be awesome. Then we've got another fun session on Wednesday, July 27th at 2 p.m., where we're going to talk about a conversation modeling technique, and we're actually going to let you guys play with it, for how to have better conversations with your colleagues and with your manager uh, in a performance review setting to get better feedback. And we'll it's a, it's a modeling technique where we'll build things and talk about them, so it's a lot of fun. Two other events to plug. Some of you, some of you guys have found this, which is awesome. Uh, I am holding Agile, uh, the United States edition of Agile Coach Camp this year in 2016. It will be held October 14th, 15th, and 16th in St. Louis, Missouri. We are open for business, registration, hotels, everything's online. So um, we'll really hope uh, you guys, uh, or if you're interested in coming to a three-day open space about Agile, join us. And thank you to people from Alaska, Tennessee, Florida, Texas, and California that have already registered to attend. So, And also in St. Louis, in September 2016, we have a little one-day conference called Agile Gravy. So um, we'll put the notes to the website for all this stuff in the show notes. So check one of those events out, and hopefully we'll see you there. So, John, what do you got? I just have a couple of picks. I just finished watching a great documentary by Alex Gibney, who's one of my favorite documentary guys, and I'm a big documentary watcher. This one is called Zero Days, and it's pretty new. Just came out in, uh, recently here in 2016, and it's a, it's a really interesting documentary that's all about the Stuxnet virus. And uh, what was what I found particularly interesting about it is that it seemed that there was an iterative approach to designing and, and creating the the virus because there were many versions of it that were released. Uh, so that's an interesting movie. If you have some time, check it out. Zero days. Finally, my last pick since Amos is not here, I've taken it upon myself to drink the alcohol for the episode. And uh, I am enjoying tonight a, a drink called not your father's root beer. Uh, it's a hard root beer. It's actually an ale with spices that tastes very much like root beer. And uh, I enjoyed it very much. So check that out. Those are our picks for this episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Check us out on our website, thisagilelife.com. And uh, I'll probably include a link out on the website to the new T-shirts that we're getting created. I hope those are going to be available very, very soon. All right, that's it for this episode. Thanks, everyone, and keep living this Agile life. This Agile life is brought to you by a community of Agile developers and coaches aspiring to spread the word about this groundbreaking approach to software development. Join us at thisagilelife.com forward slash community.